It's just seven years now since, in fact, seven years last Sunday, uh, since the Minister for Immigration, Senator Vanstone, uh, announced major changes to immigration and asylum laws and created the post of immigration <coughs> ombudsman. And, and that followed the release of, of a scathing report, a, a report that uh, found systemic weaknesses and deep-seated cultural and attitudinal problems amongst officials in the then Department of Immigration. The changes to the law uh, created this special purpose role of immigration ombudsman and assigned one particular task of a statutory review of the circumstances of anybody who'd been in immigration detention for more than, uh, than two years. Well, three years later, in fact, the anniversary for that, also July, next week, was when another minister, in this case, uh, Senator Chris Evans, announced a cabinet decision which, in his announcement, was aimed at restoring integrity to Australia's immigration system. This new policy was based on a rejection of the notion that dehumanising and punishing unauthorised arrivals with long-term detention acted as a deterrent. Henceforth, he said, the immigration ombudsman uh, would be asked to review the cases of everybody who'd been in immigration detention for just six months or more and to report uh, to him on their circumstances and the suitability of uh, continuing immigration detention. Also, uh, children, including juvenile crew members of fishing boats, would no longer be kept in detention centres. Indefinite or arbitrary detention was ruled not acceptable. Confinement to detention centres of anyone was to be used as a last resort and for the shortest possible time. Finally, people in immigration detention were to be treated fairly and reasonably, ensuring the inherent dignity of the human person. Well, my brief term as Commonwealth and Immigration Ombudsman commenced in August uh, 2010. And from my very first day in that post, it was obvious to me that there were three pressing issues which were going to use up pretty well all of my time. And those were uh, some of the administrative, uh, the administrative plight of Indigenous Australians, social justice and asylum seekers. And they form the greatest challenges for the office and that this paper sets out to explore from an ombudsman's point of view uh, the human rights promises made in relation to asylum seekers by successive governments, their performance to date, and then to consider prospects for the future. So the narrator, that's me, I'm a former immigration ombudsman um, who mistakenly believed that the government was genuine in its commitment to what it described as the compassionate and tolerant treatment of asylum seekers, administrative justice, and the honouring of Australia's international treaty obligations. Well, to many in this audience, the notion that the Commonwealth Ombudsman or the Immigration Ombudsman uh, had or could have a major role in the protection of the human rights of asylum seekers might seem rather novel. And indeed, traditionally, the discourse about human rights um, is about the legislature, the parliament, uh, enacting laws which constrain abuse by the executive government and that way protecting individuals, while the courts, through litigation, uh, prevent the abuse of, of those rights. And in the context of immigration and asylum matters, up until not many years ago, I guess that was a fair description of the key players in that, where that non-government organisations were agitating both to the parliament to have laws made or changed or, or reviewed, while the courts were there as a backstop to, uh, to, to enforce that law. And it was legislative action through both the 
Howard government, the Vanstone reforms that I mentioned a while ago, and the Rudd government, and then um, more recently the cabinet decision of 2008, driven by a then activist uh, immigration minister, the former Chris Evans, um, who changed all that. Or did they? The Office of the Ombudsman is part of uh, a growth in what many administrative lawyers and uh, constitutional experts describe as the growth of the fourth arm of government or the review arm of government or the oversight arm of, of government. And that's about the problems in administration where the growth is a significant recent development and in a way it's transforming the very governance of government because where you add a body like an ombudsman which is not part of uh, the parliament and it's not part of the executive it's a, a statutorily independent group uh, whose role is to represent the interests of users of, uh, of government administrative services and to highlight um, where, there are, where there are problems and there's a, a clear human rights potential there. Well, its growth is because of the multiplying complexity of government itself. The implementation of, uh, of myriad policies, the interconnection between different departments, the contracting out of, of so many services, all of those things uh, uh, highly uh, complicate uh, issues. And just think of the movement of people across borders and around the world and, and the way they do that and the speed with which they do it. Uh, and that uh, traditional forms of obtaining uh, justice or remedies just can't keep up with that. And so I'd also like to think that that fourth arm idea uh, has developed in recognition that there were and continue to be some very practical challenges uh, in the effective protection of human rights through the legislative or judicial arms. And while the legislature is, of course, the key national <coughs> forum for discussion of, uh, of policy and debate and for uh, debating the suitability of laws, it's more limited in its capacity to determine whether laws are correctly interpreted or administered. And anybody looking at the asylum debate and the totally dysfunctional nature of the Commonwealth Parliament at the moment, you can see that uh, protection of the human rights of asylum seekers is just beyond the capacity of this current parliament. The judiciary, on the other hand, provides a pretty key role in the, in the protection of rights, but it's a bit limited in its scope as well. Courts only decide the cases that they consider, and to some degree they're, they're rather restricted in the remedies that they can offer. And, of course, typically they don't supervise the decisions that they make. But it is also the case that recently we've seen uh, some, uh, some really great uh, steps taken by the courts. The High Court in particular in its, uh, in its review of offshore processing and uh, the legality of that and in relation to the Christmas, uh, the, the Malaysian uh, swap deal shows that there is a, a vital role there but it's a, it's a different one. And I think it's necessary to address the limits of the power of both the judiciary uh, and the legislature to understand that at a day-to-day -day level, a transaction level, if you like, uh, there is a need for, for bodies uh, like ombudsmen uh, who can act to effectively supervise the executive branch. So oversight bodies, and I'd include in that the Office of the Ombudsman, the Information Commissioner, perhaps the Office of... Uh, of the Auditor Human Rights Commission, they all uh, theoretically respond much more quickly uh, and uh, are more fleet of foot in being able to deal uh, with issues, individual complaint investigations, reports, um, and, and the like. And importantly, they're designed to be much more accessible to larger range of people uh, than the courts. Uh, even though the courts can be very active, even though at times, say, in the immigration area, that more than half of all the cases on the docket of the federal court are immigration cases. Still, that's only a question of a few thousands compared to the tens and hundreds of thousands of potential uh, problems that can arise. So 
Um, I've just described uh, somewhat the promise, the promise of the model of the fourth arm, the, the model of the powers of the immigration ombudsman, the commitment by the government and the cabinet uh, to, uh, to giving Australia um, a much better system. I'd like now uh, to consider the performance of the ombudsman as a protector of human rights of asylum seekers. And I'll focus on the significant numbers of asylum seekers who've arrived on our shores by boat, and particularly those arriving at Christmas Island as a particular case study of the role of the uh, ombudsman in that area. And it was quite obvious to me uh, from the beginning that it was the interaction between the very many departments involved and pretty well, well not all, but uh, probably well over half of the Commonwealth departments have some role to play uh, in one way or another with, uh, with, with Christmas Island. And that the links between those connections and, and critical issues uh, matter a lot and affect uh, the, the, the rights of, of individuals um, all over the place. The Commonwealth Ombudsman was first invited into this role, as I mentioned earlier, back in uh, 2005, and that was in the wake of a couple of incidents that no democratic country should ever be proud of. And that was the investigation into the Cornelia Rao affair, a case of wrongful detention of a permanent resident, uh, and then when Vivian Alvarez came along, another scandalous abuse of power by the, the department, uh, the government set up an inquiry. All in all, the Ombudsman's Office investigated 247 claims of, uh, of abuse of, of power by the department, wrongful decisions and, uh, and loss of rights by people in immigration detention. And following the release of that report, lots of changes were made to the law, some administrative changes were made to the department, but one of the critical ones was that henceforth the Ombudsman would have a much closer uh, scrutinising role over what went on there and, uh, and that led to lots of uh, uh, visits to detention centres and reports on, on things of, of that sort. Uh, they were all done through amendments to both the Migration Act and to the Ombudsman's Act itself. So the specialist powers were more recently, uh, in 2008, uh, expanded to include reviews after six months and, and also uh, control or a supervising role on Christmas Island uh, itself. And so uh, in, in since then, uh, the Ombudsman's Office has had that uh, jurisdiction. Now, the agreement made with uh, Senator Evans in 2008 uh, was that resources would be provided for those six-month reports. And the initial resource base, based on an expectation that there would be 100 offshore arrivals a year. Well, uh, by uh, 2010, uh, there were 4,700 uh, people in immigration detention more than 3,200 of whom had been in detention for more than six months and thus hit that trigger for an ombudsman's review as to the suitability of their detention, their mental health and, and whether they had any complaints and things like that. Uh, clearly, it was quite an impossible task and that the, um, the, the result of that is that the ombudsman uh, was incapable of doing the job that they were asked to do. I wrote a paragraph for the last annual report, Ombudsman's annual report, that said, the consequence of the large and rapid growth in irregular maritime arrivals is that in relation to the work of the Immigration Ombudsman and in the absence of substantial additional resources to my office, I'm unable to provide overall assurances to the public and to the Parliament that fair and accountable administrative action is being taken by responsible Australian government agencies. Um, I can't provide you with a footnote for that reference, as I have in my paper to all of the others, uh, because that paragraph never turned up in the annual report. Um, I left the, the office in November last year, and that though the annual report had been completed before I left, um, it didn't actually appear on the streets, I think, until March or April this year, and it's not the annual report that I wrote. Well, the Christmas Island Report, a key uh, report that uh, 
that the office commissioned during my period there uh, was based on eight visits to Christmas Island over uh, a couple of years where we investigated the circumstances of people, the, the conditions, and, uh, and, and a whole range of the things like that. Uh, we reported at the time that there were just far too many people um, on the island, that the services were, were stretched to breaking point, that uh, <coughs> mental health and self-harm issues were out of control, and that desperate action was needed by the government if it was going to avoid catastrophe. This report was given to the department and the government in September of 2011, uh, six months later, where very few of those recommendations had been implemented, although they were agreed. Uh, we saw the, uh, the destructive uh, uh, riots on Christmas Island that were sadly the ones that were predicted in my report because of failure of uh, successive uh, administrations or the department to respond to, to, to those things. Um, there were 3,045 people in detention on Christmas Island at the time uh, of these problems. It was intended to have 744, or at an emergency crush, 2,500. So it was so far overcrowded that it's hardly surprising that those events uh, occurred. It was unsustainable, and uh, as we now know, um, it, uh, it, it blew up. The uh, office gave a whole set of recommendations, some of which were followed up then, many of which have been uh, follow up, followed up uh, uh, later on. Um, and anybody who wants to read all those in detail, have a look at the paper and the footnotes uh, in it. When I uh, released the report, there was uh, quite a bit of publicity and the government did commit to a number of the changes. And to date, some of those have been carried out uh, but, uh, but, but not all. The practice of keeping uh, people detained on Christmas Island still forms a part of uh, government policy. Uh, and that's seen, well, not, not government policy, of government practice. It flies quite directly in the face of the statement made in the new policy adopted by Cabinet in July um, 2000. And, eight. and that even though the government committed to and has now moved many people from Christmas Island to onshore detention centres, uh, many of the problems persist because the government has selected many quite remote sites, uh, uh, Leonora, Curtin and, and, uh, and Sugar and others, as bases in which to put detainees. These share a common characteristic with Christmas Island in that they are extremely remote and inhospitable. The consequences of that are from an administrative level, they are hideously expensive to support, to, to find staff to send there, uh, to resupply and all of those things costs an absolute fortune. And then from the point of view of asylum seekers, they're even worse because contact with legal representatives or agents or access to, uh, to, to, to medical services, mental health services, or the ability to make contact with people uh, who they know is almost impossible. And that it's my assertion that the remote uh, detention centres within Australia are little better than Christmas Island itself and are, in my view, quite clearly in breach of that, uh, that policy that the, the government adopted. It's so something of a a moral dilemma, it seems to me, uh, and, and that is that it's my considered view that as long as there are families with children, unaccompanied minors, and other vulnerable people in immigration detention facilities, however they're described, because the policy said that no children will be kept in an immigration detention facility, but with a sleight of hand, a new group of facilities which were just as, uh, as forbidding came up called alternative places of detention, which aren't detention facilities. Um, I regard that as a, as a fraud, uh, and, that, um, and it's equally a breach of, uh, the, of that policy. Well, the government announced these, uh, these new values in, in July uh, 2008, and provided also a number of publicly funded measures for review of, of decisions, 
and for negative assessments, and of course conferred this broader role on the immigration ombudsman. Uh, the key to that was the use of more, the policy use of more community detention. I'm, I'm pleased to say that we've seen huge numbers of people in the last uh, year or so move into community uh, detention, and that that these values that were supposed to underpin all of the decisions and operations of the uh, Department of, of Immigration and Citizenship uh, and also to contractors are uh, honoured more um, in, in the breach. Unfortunately, we've seen further deterioration in the mental health of, uh, of, of many individuals and that there are crises abounding across the whole of the, the detention area. So while the government has acted and human rights groups and, and I too uh, welcome that, I'd have to say that it's taken so long and done with such reluctance that one wonders if the heart was really in it. And my principal concern is that the huge executive powers of agencies who have people in detention are bad enough, hence uh, police cells and other places of detention, uh, when they're in remote areas, all of those problems become magnified and without the ability for some close supervision for complaints handling and review, uh, whether by the Human Rights Commission or Ombudsman or others, uh, one can expect, one does expect and one sees uh, abuses of, uh, of people's rights. Uh, suicide and self-harm uh, is, to my mind, one of the most pressing concerns and something that needs uh, urgent action. Last year, on the anniversary of the announcement by Senator Evans of the new role for the Immigration Ombudsman and the announcement of those new immigration detention values, um, I announced an investigation into suicide and self-harm in uh, places of uh, detention. It alarmed me that in a visit to Christmas Island in, in June, June 2011, there were more than 30 incidents of self-harm reported in the very week uh, that, that I was there. There were more than 1,100 such incidents reported uh, throughout the year, and, uh, and that plus uh, five uh, suspected uh, suicides, uh, subject to confirmation by coroners, meant that this is a, a serious, out-of-control situation, and that we've had in the past large numbers in immigration detention, but never the degree of, of self-harm and attempted suicide and the goal of this uh, investigation was to discover um, why that was the case. The, uh, the, the, the complaints handling role of the Ombudsman was able to determine that there were three outstanding issues and they were the impact of long-term detention uh, on the ongoing mental health of, of detainees, what appears to be worrying levels of, of self-harm in the facilities, and then, of course, uh, actual suicides and, and attempted suicides. So I wasn't really uh, surprised when Professor Pat McGorry, uh, the Australian of the Year for 2010, described uh, facilities like Christmas Island as mental illness factories. Uh, recent international studies, uh, detail this at, at some length in, in the paper that you can have a look at, show just the devastating and long-term effects of failure to deal with mental illness in its earliest stages, including uh, the various traumas and, and, uh, and torture survivors' uh, uh, experiences. And I point out that the vast majority of asylum seekers, many of these people who are kept for sometimes years and years, go on to become uh, refugees and found to be uh, owed a duty of care and become uh, members of, of Australian society, become uh, citizens and residents. And even, I mean, the, the tragedy from their point of view of going through the rest of their life with much worse forms of illness than were necessary, but even in a more practical, pragmatic way, the healthcare costs of releasing into the community people for whom society as a whole will now have a, a double burden for perhaps 50 or 60 years to deal with many of these mental health issues which were made much worse while they were in detention. Self-harm rates also 
um, were, were, were very high. Um, I'll, I'll move on from that to the discussion of another issue, and, and that is use of force. After the uh, riots in, in March 2011, there were uh, uh, quite a few graphic accounts of the way in which the Australian Federal Police uh, arrived on, on Christmas Island to uh, to uh, retake uh, possession of of the North uh, Northwest Point facilities and, and otherwise, and that uh, I asked the, uh, the the department for reports on that and uh, told them that I was going to investigate whether the, there was adequate coordination between the federal police, uh, CERCO, and the Department of Immigration. While I was doing that, uh, the minister announced his own inquiry, and he appointed two former department secretaries, Secretary Hawke and Secretary Williams, to do a report for him on that. I felt that their report um, wouldn't have the sufficient powers. The Ombudsman has the power of a Royal Commissioner, has the power to demand uh, documents, compel witnesses, and, uh, and to bring all of these links together. Uh, I have to say that uh, when I left my post uh, last year, um, I thought that investigation was well advanced and expected that it would be uh, sent to departments and published by the end of last year. Uh, to date, I've seen nothing. There appears to be no reference on the Ombudsman's website to it, and uh, I don't know what's happened to that. Similarly, the suicide and self-harm report, which when I announced it was due to be released in December last year, um, that hasn't seen the light of day either, and I'm quite alarmed at the prospect that uh, one or both of those reports have been so long delayed, and I look forward uh, to those uh, being released at the shortest possible time. Another issue I'd like to, to touch on is the plight of security refused refugees. These are people who have been found to be refugees under Australia's reasonably stringent assessment system, uh, but do not have a security clearance from ASIO. And I guess uh, most people here will have, will have heard the, the stories uh, 53 or so individuals uh, who, without ever being charged of any, uh, with any offence, without even an accusation, uh, without even being given an explanation because the criteria are secret, that ASIO has a permanent veto on them ever being released into the Australian community. Now, <clears throat> the Ombudsman's Office has no jurisdiction over the uh, decisions of, of ASIO, but it does have jurisdiction to investigate the circumstances of those individuals after six months and two years, and to report to Parliament on that. And there are now uh, a whole raft of reports that have been submitted to the Minister and tabled in Parliament. <clears throat> he uh, dismissively says of most of them that um, there's no way that he would ever act to compromise the security of Australia. Um, I find that to be a largely unthinking um, response, and I've, I've described it in the past as a, as a sign of, of what I regard as moral cowardice. It's partly built on the fear that uh, some of the toxic journalists and uh, <clears throat> the level of toxic critique in Parliament means that uh, the government is somewhat afraid uh, to, to take uh, any action, even though it knows that uh, morally um, it should. Uh, and, and that's uh, an outstanding issue. Um, I said right at the beginning that I thought there were limitations on what the courts could do um, and the legislature. But in the case of, of uh, security refused asylum seekers, uh, both of those offer some hope. Recently, a parliamentary inquiry recommended in very strong terms that appeal rights be given uh, to such individuals and they describe a range of mechanisms that might be used there. And indeed, right at this moment, the High Court is uh, considering uh, another challenge to the, uh, the legislation under which uh, these people are held and that there's uh, uh, a chance for some action there. Um, Indonesian 
uh, fishermen is another issue that uh, is a great concern to me. Possibly hundreds of uh, juveniles uh, who are currently remain in Australian uh, adult prisons, <coughs> quite uh, quite wrongly, and based on often very poor uh, levels of, of forensic evidence as to their age. Uh, I spent some time in Indonesia last year uh, working with their ombudsman's office. Uh, one of their biggest concerns is the practice in Indonesia of putting juveniles in adult prisons. How ironic that Australia uh, offering this assistance at one level at another level has been putting Indonesian children in our own adult jails. A couple of conclusions and prospects. <coughs> at the outset, I described the, the role of, uh, of, of the legislature uh, and the judiciary and, and some of their limitations. I also pointed to the big powers and what appeared to be the commitment of the government to making the Ombudsman a significant player in uh, protecting the human rights of, uh, of asylum seekers. I have to say that uh, without adequate support from uh, the government, that simply could not work and has not worked. Uh, most particularly, relevant ministers are at times quite resistant and resentful of the efforts of the Ombudsman every time there's a criticism of, uh, of, of administration. And further, that despite finding uh, huge new resources for asylum issues, uh, tens of millions for the expansion of offshore uh, places like uh, uh, Christmas Island and, and remote detention centres, uh, finding millions more uh, for ASIO for uh, security work and policing and for the administrators um, of, of those facilities, not a single cent was found for the increased work of the Ombudsman's Office in this last um, year or two in relation to asylum work, uh, which meant that the Office simply was not able even to visit uh, remote places of detention, much less spend the time in collecting, investigating and dealing with the cases of the many thousands of people uh, to whom it has that, um, that, that obligation. Uh, what do the government's seven key immigration detention values really mean today? Are they milestones to a fairer society or just parenthood statements that have been overtaken uh, by reality? Uh, the challenges associated with immigration detention aren't going to diminish, they aren't going to go away. And just uh, for example, the Malaysian, the Malaysian swap, even if that was approved, uh, it is just so self-evident that um, that following the, uh, the, the sending of, of 800 people to Malaysia, that the whole problem starts again, and that there's just no adequate thought to what would happen uh, beyond that. My conclusion is that the Immigration Ombudsman certainly has the legal powers, the experience and skills to play a significant role in the promotion of human rights of asylum seekers, but nevertheless, without the active support um, of the, the government or the parliament, uh, it will always uh, uh, underperform in, in that area. Uh, in fact, I was just thinking that uh, I might uh, contract with uh, Sam Bengalia to come and run a campaign to, uh, to restore the Ombudsman's uh, role somewhat uh, in, in Canberra. Uh, I believe that the best prospects for, uh, for, for promoting the human rights of asylum seekers will come in a renewed commitment to those elements of that, uh, that plan about treating people with dignity, about using immigration detention only as a last resort, uh, about not keeping uh, foreign fishers or children in detention, about the use of, uh, of, of more community detention, all of those things, by those still remain formally government policy, and I believe that they should be um, reactivated and that um, <coughs> uh, civil society organisations uh, should, should take those up and to, to seek action through parliamentary committees uh, and in other ways uh, to, to make the organisation perform in the way it was um, in, intended. Um, July, uh, I mentioned, a, a big month, but uh, sadly 
it's looking uh, pretty grim at the moment. As I understand it, um, <coughs> since I, uh, I left the, the office uh, at the end of October last year, that no new appointment has been made, that uh, there have been even further resource and funding cuts, and that um, I, uh, I really fear uh, not so much for the office, that too, but for the uh, failure of the office to provide that range of, of services, that range of protection to the human rights of, uh, of people uh, for which it was established. Well, for my part, I remain ready, willing and able to work with anyone who wants to promote the human rights of asylum seekers. But I also remain ready, willing and able to work against those who don't. Thank you. So you went and a social worker who's worked with refugees and asylum seekers in Australia. Um, Alan, it's really worrying because you made the point that the Ombudsman's Office now doesn't have the funds to do the, the scrutiny and visits, and we know that the Human Rights Commission has just withdrawn. The only person, the only organisation that can is the Red Cross, uh, and we do know they do excellent work, but we also know that they're not going to be in a power, to a powerful position to speak out. I think these changes are very worrying for our society and uh, a sad change. Well, I'd certainly agree with that. <clears throat> um, I'm uh, of the view that within the Parliament there are many backbenchers, both uh, government uh, backbenchers and opposition ones, who similarly are outraged at the failure of governments and the opposition front bench to support scrutiny agencies. It's just that we have such a highly dysfunctional and toxic state of politics at the moment that nobody dares speak. And I would, I would implore uh, those participating in this conference to, uh, to constantly remind any uh, backbenchers, uh, any uh, party members that you know, that Australia has to retain some of the integrity in the policies that it's had for most of the post-war years, and that we have to look uh, on a trajectory of improving uh, the situation. The Information Commissioner has, uh, has announced that he can't do his work, the Human Rights Commission, uh, the Ombudsman, and these are actually pretty vital institutions and our, uh, our democracy actually is diminished. Hi, I'm Mira Allen from the MITRT. I have a question for Ron, although Alan probably might have an opinion on this. Um, there has been a, a shift towards uh, further discretion for the minister, particularly in immigration, and you and I had a conversation about that earlier on. Um, given the court's movements in M61 uh, towards the ability to, in fact, review discretionary decisions, or at least the process by which we get to discretionary decisions, which, of course, we saw also in the Hamid case, my question is, do you think that there's a possibility that the court will possibly continue to intervene in things like uh, the discretion under the Migrations 417, which is where the minister gets to change a decision to a more positive decision. Um, and if he chooses not to exercise that, there's a process by which uh, he's advised on it. Could that find itself under review, possibly? Could decisions about whether or not he'll take an ASIO opinion end up under review? I mean, to what extent do you see in the future this power being expanded by the, the courts? Particularly since that power seems to now devolve down to the Federal Magistrates Court, although I have to admit I'm not clear how that could possibly happen. Well, I guess I would just say, as I think I probably mentioned earlier, that the continued growth especially in jurisdictional error in uh, judicial review, um, is always going to provide a, a fertile field 
for a high court that's wanting to uh, uh, to exercise some supervision of the executive. And I think um, the, the government, where the, the, the best thing for community groups is that the government seems to have pretty appalling uh, legal advice and pretty appalling advice. Uh, my question for Jonathan Dyke, my name is Rosalind Hoffman, I'm the Victorian Bar, and I practice in immigration and refugee law exclusively in those areas. Um, question for both speakers is, in light of the uh, High Court's willingness to intervene, uh, and in a wide variety of areas that impact on human rights. Do you think that there's any scope that they'll revisit uh, the decision in Alcatel, which basically um, held that the Australian government has the right to detain people forever? Um, do, I'm just wondering to see if you think there's any scope for revisiting that. If, if I could just say that on one aspect of that, uh, I reckon that it's not going to be long before the High Court does find in Australian common law that decision makers actually have to have reasons for a decision. That's stopping short of disclosing them, but I think that that will be a, a real turning point in things like that because of the internal mechanisms and the opportunities for review that might come out of that. Although the actual powers um, I think um, the, the time of decision of Alfred Hedden was itself, I think, part of the problem. 